Are we good? Hi, everybody. There we go. Hi, everybody. Welcome to GunCon 2024. I really, really appreciate you guys being here. Let's get a round of applause for all the amazing sponsors here. Thank you. Thank you. Now, what we are going to do is have the first ever GunCon Second Amendment panel. Before you are some of the juggernauts of the Second Amendment space. These guys up here are incredible representatives, and I'm going to introduce them right now. To my left, we have Jared from Guns and Gadgets. Jared's an amazing guy, great channel. Next to him, we have Anthony from Arm Scholar. And then next to him, we, we have Richard Rogers from IFC, Iowa Firearms Coalition. That's right. To my left, immediately, is Travis White from FRAC, Firearms Regulatory, what is it? Accountability. Accountability Coalition, it's a long one. FRAC, they're great, it's awesome. <laughs> to my right, we have Eric Pratt from GOA. Woo. Then we have my good friend Paul Glasgow from Legally Armed America. And then as some of you know, the legend, the myth, Adam Kraut from Second Amendment Foundation. And then we have Diana Muller from Women for Gun Rights. Yes. Yeah. Now, if you guys want to go ahead and stand up, there are a couple microphones on either side. If you have a question, now is the time to get in line to ask that question. That would be freaking amazing. Now, I'm going to crack it off. Uh, anybody can just jump in on this one. Anybody up here on stage can just jump in. What do you think the biggest issue pressing us all is regarding the Second Amendment? The biggest issue happening right now? The ATF is communist. <laughs> That's fair. I mean, they are a terrorist organization at this point. Right? Anybody else? The constant threat of red flag gun law legislation. I think that's the most dangerous. Why do you think that's the most dangerous thing? Because it will be absolutely abused, and most of us up here probably could be victims of it. That's right. That's right. That's right. Again, guys, there are microphones on either side of the room. If you have a question, go ahead and stand up. There's one over here and one to my right. Matt, do you have a question, brother? Yes, I do. Um, so for people like myself who want to support... Get a little closer to the mic for me. People like myself who want to support all of your organizations, but financially can probably send money to like one um, GOA for me specifically. Um, what are other ways that individuals can do the most amount of good for your organizations outside of financial aid? That's a great question. Who wants to jump on that one? I'll take it. Great, thanks Adam. <laughs> Since you already support GOA. Um, I think one of the ways that people can help is by just sharing the work that organizations do do. There's a lot of misconceptions or just lack of awareness of other organizations in the space uh, and the work that is, you know, comprises of their, their body. Uh, so, for instance, you know, the Second Amendment Foundation, uh, I know you're familiar with GOA. They're very busy in the court system. They also do do lobbying and grassroots lobbying. Uh, but SAF has been active in the court system as well for um, a very long time involved in over 260 cases. And sharing information like that, uh, I think, just drives awareness to other organizations. And, and that's you know, incredibly valuable as well. Dollars, yeah, as Eric, I'm sure will tell you, dollars drive the ability to do work, but also people knowing you exist is the baseline of that. Yeah, great response. Anybody else want to jump on that? The best got, thing besides money? I got a little bit. So this goes to the first question as well, what's the most dangerous threat and then what can you do about it? Uh, from my perspective, I think that the most dangerous threat is the overall negativity towards gun and gun owners. So just recently there was a Congressional Sportsman's Foundation just put out a, um, a poll saying that nationwide decline in approval of hunters and gun owners. It's about the big picture here, folks. This is, this, is your, this is them influencing your friends, your families, their neighbors, and their legislators for decades, intentionally. 
And we don't tend to run intentionally. We intend to run a little bit lackadaisical that we've got the Constitution, that nothing's going to happen. But I'm telling you, things are going to happen. And everybody's kind of seeing it, seeing their, their, their great work is now uh, coming to fruition. They planted seeds a long time ago, and they're harvesting a crop. We need to do the same thing. What you can do is if you want to be able to influence your friends and your families, I always talk about education. Education, there's an internal component to education and there's an external component to education for gun owners. Everybody in this room, if you don't know how to explain in 10 seconds or less why you need an AR-15 tactfully and not from my cold, dead hands, then you have work to do. Um, so that's an internal component to education. The external component to education are the people who are outside these walls who don't have any, uh, any kind of experience with our, our culture or our people. That means smiling at them and being nice to them and not calling them dumb names on the, you know, when they ask a dumb question because we're smart and we know more than you. It's sure. being kind. Thank you. That, that is an excellent response. Thanks for the great question, man. I appreciate I'd, that. I'd like to jump in on that if I might. Sure. As the only uh, representative here of a state-level organization, uh, I'd like to answer both questions. First of all, one of the greatest dangers, if not the greatest danger, is perhaps complacency on the uh, part of uh, gun owners or Second Amendment advocates in, the, in states, in the red states, where things are going well, like Iowa, uh, not perfect, but very well, people have a tendency not to, not to get active. Things are pretty good. Back sure. when we had... Sheriffs had absolute discretion over whether to issue a permit and any restrictions they wanted on your permit uh, under the May issue regime. Uh, people, people got incensed, they got active. And that's how our organization got started. So that's one thing, but I would say the best thing you can do is get involved with your local state organization. Now, a lot of folks here are from other states, and so you're gonna need to find the organization in your state. But we're an all, Iowa Firearms Coalition is an all-volunteer organization, and we need people both facing the public and on the back end dealing with computers and marketing and graphics and things like that. But also we need our members, we need to grow our membership, get your friends and neighbors involved, and then go meet your legislator when they're having a neighborhood coffee or a, a rally or an event, but get to know them and they go to you and let them know your concern. So I think that's the most important thing it's a lot easier to deal with 150 legislators at the Iowa Capitol than it is with 535 in Washington, D.C., Sure, and it's sure. a lot easier to make a big change. Thanks, Richard. That's a great question, brother. I think really it, it comes down to just getting involved, share everything you can, get involved where you can, spend your time because your time is also valuable, and all these organizations can use your time and your help. Thank you, brother. Hey, John, let me, uh, let me just real, real quick add on to that. The biggest thing that we can do as a community we have a pretty big election coming this, this year that this country might not survive if we don't make real changes. Just in Iowa, I gotta look at my cell phone, forgive me. Just in this state, there are 136,747 hunters and gun owners that are not even registered to vote. Mm. That is a wow. huge problem. Nationally, there are 9,988,407 gun owners and hunters that aren't even registered to vote. A big part of why we have the issues we have is because of those numbers. Now, everybody in this room knows somebody who falls into that category. For whatever their reasoning is, it's time to tell them, it's time to do what the forefathers gave us, and that's part of the system of fixing things is the electoral process. So if we had 10 million more people voting for liberty to keep out this, the communist stuff, we wouldn't be having to say what we're saying now. Yeah. John, could I jump in real quick? Um, the only uh, the thing I want to echo a little bit is um, we talked a lot about state orgs. National orgs are awesome. I, I mean, I love all the national orgs here. Um, but a lot of people aren't aware that these national orgs also have state affiliates. So, like, for example, GOA and GOC work close together. I'm in California. Um, you have CRPA in California. So don't overlook the state orgs that are going to directly impact your state issues. I, I love national orgs, I push you guys, I try to drive as many memberships as I can to you guys, but don't overlook your state orgs. And even within those state orgs, a lot of times they will have county memberships as well. So I helped open a county um, org for CRPA in the Tulare Kings area in, in California, and that's all volunteer. I, um, I'm a board member, we go to meetings, we do all that, we do community outreach. So also don't overlook that, and like Jared said, go vote. 
if you have a friend who's a gun owner who hasn't voted in you know, 10 years, get them registered to vote and go out and vote. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Again, thank you for the question. Hey, I want to make sure that everybody that's watching out there live understands that the sponsor of this here live stream, the Second Amendment live stream here at GunCon, is Brownells. Can we get a round of applause for Brownells? Yeah, that's right. They have come in huge to sponsor this. And there is a discount code for anybody out there watching live. The code is GUNCON24. You can see it on your screen. Go get yourself a little discount, a little money off the top. That is always appreciated. Shout out again to Brownells for supporting this. Let's take another question. Go ahead, brother. What's your question? First of all, I'd like to thank all of you for what you do. Make sure you get close to that microphone. Yes, yes sir. Thanks for all that you do in supporting of all of us and on a daily basis. In light of yesterday's record-setting SCOTUS decision on Chevron deference, how do you all feel about how that's going to impact uh, ATF and our issues moving forward? It's, it's record-setting and earth-shaking as far as I know, and I don't know how many people are aware of just what happened yesterday. That's a, that's a big deal. Go ahead, Eric. Yeah, Chevron case is huge. Uh, and by the way, uh, thank you for those of you who uh, are supporting the groups up here, supporting GOA, because you keep us on the front lines in the courts. Uh, GOA did have an amicus in that case. And really, it's all about forcing administrative agencies. If you're not familiar with the Chevron uh, case, this is forcing administrative agencies to stay in their lane and stop going beyond the law, stop going beyond the Constitution. Um, I, I think ATF had already seen the writing on the wall because in several of our previous cases, uh, dealing with bump stocks and pistol braces, they had told the judges, we're not claiming Chevron deference. In other words, they weren't appealing to that, uh, which probably hurt them in one sense, uh, but they already were starting to back away from that Chevron. So I think probably people will see uh, help in, in other issues outside of guns, because again, ATF was already distancing themselves from it. But all that being said, there have been a slew of good cases that have come down the pike. Just recently, uh, we got a preliminary injunction uh, in a federal district court in Texas. Uh, to prevent the ATF from enforcing their engaged in the business rule. So if you're a GOA member or you live in one of five states, uh, you're not going to be penalized if you try to sell a gun privately or uh, purchase a gun privately. Now let me tell you, we, we, we are fighting for all gun owners. That's all that the judge gave us was for GOA members and the members of Texas, Utah, Louisiana, uh, Mississippi, and Alabama. Uh, but, you know, we're going to, as, as we keep fighting this, we're, we want to win this for all gun owners, gun owners. So that was one huge victory. The Rahimi decision uh, was kind of mixed, uh, but just let me pick uh, a good part of the Rahimi decision that came down last, uh, not this past week, but the week before. In Rahimi, they essentially, and I'm not an attorney, so I'm going to give it to you in layman's terms, they basically said, that the Second Amendment doesn't say the right of responsible people right. to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. That word responsible is not in there. So that means if you have parking tickets, your right to keep and bear arms can't be denied. If you hold politically incorrect views, your right to keep and bear arms can't be denied. That's huge because in our case, which we may find out Monday, we have a, a New York case, Anton Yuck, where they were preventing concealed carriers. You know, the Bruin case, let me backtrack. The Bruin case said there is a right to carry outside of the home. New York said, okay, fine. We'll just make it impossible for you to carry a gun anywhere. And that's the new thing now, right? States saying there's sensitive, quote unquote, sensitive places where you can't carry. So we're challenging that. It's before the Supreme Court on cert, a petition for cert. We don't know what happened in their conference on Thursday, but we'll find out Monday if they're going to take that case. So that's another big case to be looking for. I, I think it's great. Just, just the fact that you are paying attention, and a lot of you guys sitting out here are paying attention to stuff like this. I remember about five, six years ago when we started, 
you know, uh, doing bigger events like this, this, this was not a thing. People were not tied into this community. They were not focused on the Second Amendment. And I think we have all really started to realize how big of an issue this can be for us. Thank you for that question. And John, Peter. can I just give one shout out? Thank sure. you to all the YouTube influencers because y'all have Thanks, really helped to get people educated and tied in like you're just saying. Yeah, Thanks, can, I, can I just jump on? I think it's, it's pretty cool that we're, we're, it's cool that we're at Brownells and we're on a two-way panel and we're talking about Chevron deference and what impact it's gonna have on uh, <laughs> lawsuits. I mean, when I first got into the YouTube space, um, you know, the legal stuff wasn't, wasn't big. We, we didn't have a space, so it's really cool. Um, and I guess to kind of just echo what Eric was saying, the ATF had kind of abandoned Chevron for a while and some of these lawsuits like the, the cargo bump stock and all that. Um, they were arguing more specifically on the statutory text that the definition of machine gun uh, fit uh, a, a bump stock pretty much, which we knew it, it didn't. Uh, but the ATF had abandoned some of that. It had popped up here and there. Um, but it, it, it'll impact a lot of other things, uh, but the ATF had kind of abandoned that for a while. So, I just want to give a shout out to me and Adam for telling the ATF five years ago <laughs> yeah. that they, 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 were not, they were not machine guns. Okay, great question. Thank you so much, brother. Hey, Orly, can you get a question from the online audience for me? The guys out there watching live, we want to take some questions from them, too. Hey, everybody. Yeah, so we got a couple of the same questions. Hey, hold that mic nice and close. Yeah, there you go. Uh, we got a couple of the same question already. Um, people wanted to know how to get involved on a local level to change laws. Okay, so people want to know how to get involved in a local level. Several questions for that. Okay, anybody want to jump in on the best way to get involved locally? Well, with Iowa Firearms Coalition, go to iowafc.org. That's Iowa spelled out, fc, foxtrotcharlie.org. And you'll find a tremendous amount of stuff there. We do have our own YouTube channel. We don't have the uh, viewership that some of these guys do. I really appreciate being up here with them. But um, there's a lot of information out there, including uh, how to get involved. I think that might even be the title of the uh, drop down menu. So, iowafc.org. Rad. Any, anybody else local involvement? Any suggestions? Yeah, we've, uh, we've heard the, the theme a few times is, is if you want to get involved, do not forget about your local state orgs because they are the ones who know your state intimately. Uh, so call them and ask them how you can help out. Most state orgs will have things that they need help on, whether it's uh, you know meet, meeting and talking to your senators, uh, your state senators, your state reps, uh, trying to get the word out. Maybe they have some volunteer hours to help an event they have going on. There's a ton of different ways we can all be involved. You don't have to be a public speaker. You don't have to wear a suit on TV. There's a ton of stuff that we can do, and there's a ton of stuff we should do, because if uh, we can't just say, hey, you know what, SAF or, or FRAC or GOA or anybody else uh, is going to take care of it on the national level for everyone. We've seen judges don't like that. So utilize the power you have in your state because the more we can get state level support from us, we the people, that's the way it's supposed to be, I think the better off we're going to be in the long run. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody watching live right now. This is absolutely incredible. This, again, this is the first time we've done the Second Amendment panel here at GunCon. And I just want to say again, thank you to everybody out there watching live. And thank you to you people sitting right here that actually care about the Second Amendment along with us. That's, that's absolutely incredible. Can we get a, a round of applause for you guys? Yeah. Come on. Come on. Applaud yourself. I love you too. It's okay. You're, you're allowed to feel proud for a second. All right. Let's take another question. Go ahead, brother. All right. As page, am I too close? No. No, no, no. Get close. Okay. On Facebook and YouTube and the other medias that are out there are censoring what the Second Amendment, gun rights, and all that. What is a good avenue for getting out there? Because we're being uh, hammered on Facebook. YouTube won't give you the follows. What's your guys' thoughts? I'm going I'm to let one of the other creators jump in on this. So what works, what really works, is to spread the word regardless. They want us to feel that defeatist attitude. They want us to give up. Uh, screw them. Uh, we the people <laughs> are in power. So. Uh, Twitter, X, has been very, very, very friendly to us since the switch in ownership. Uh, so utilize that as much as you can. Uh, there is almost nothing that is taken down on, on X. Um, but 
echo, be, become an echo chamber for something you see, if you see a video of Anthony's that you think is solid, forward it. It takes seconds for people to forward the message and get it out. And that's a way we can have a huge impact is by just spreading the word. So don't feel down, that's what they want. It's easy, it's easy to give up. We need people just to keep, keep pushing forward. I think one of the other things that has become way more common in the last two years is the use of email lists. And I know that sounds weird, it sounds a little archaic, but as these bigger corporations crunch down on all of us, and that, that applies for the organizations and the creators, if you wanna stay in touch, if you wanna know what's going on, you sign up for everybody's email list and be a part of it because they can't really take that away from us. No, yeah. the, right. gonna... they, they are certainly going to try. Yes. They are going to try. That is a great question. Thank you so much. Let's go over here. What's your question, brother? I was wondering about um, the Supreme Court Justice uh, Soda Mayor, her uh, dissenting comments and stuff about having uh, rifles and stuff in uh, common use. How much do you think that's going to go through and affect your, your cases and stuff coming down this pipe? That, that's going to be um, some, somewhat important. So what, we have six challenges to assault weapons bans throughout the country. Right now there's a cert petition that was just recirculated for conference again on uh, yesterday, Friday. Uh, Harold vs. Raul, the assault weapons ban in magazine uh, up in uh, Illinois. And so while dissenting opinions aren't controlling, the fact that it was admitted by a justice in writing that these are common arms, uh, you know, she's not going to be able to back away from that position when it, one of those cases hopefully eventually does get before the justices. So she's going to kind of be married to it, the admission that at least they're common arms in use. Now, whether or not she tries to find other ways to justify a ban, I'm sure. But um, so it is helpful for sure. Anybody else want to jump on that? Travis, do you have anything to add to that one? Well, you know, I've been waiting for an opportunity to, to jump in on some of the, the earlier questions. I, I think I can tie it in here. The biggest thing I'm seeing is, the, one, the weaponization of lawfare against so industry group, right? Yeah. Speaking from the perspective of, of manufacturers, distributors, and dealers. Um, the, the weaponization of lawfare, and particularly where they will, the other side will plug in their funding mechanism to municipal governments. So it's sort of like when you were a kid, right? The birthday boy gets the garden hose. Everybody else has to have like the pump gun, right? They're the birthday boy with the garden hose is plugged into the house, litigating in waves against the industry with basically unlimited money. And so there, it's a way to convert public funds into a battering ram against a politically disfavored industry. So we have to find ways to cut that off. Now, the second point I'll make is their attack is very comprehensive. So a lot of times we talk about gun rights, we talk about the Second Amendment, we're very narrow focused on things that have the word gun in them or are overtly a Second Amendment or firearm related uh, piece of legislation or policy measure, right? The other side takes a more comprehensive, uh, unconventional approach to this, this assault of theirs on, on the industry and on the Second Amendment. They, they don't look at just anti-gun legislation. They look at things like bank, bank rules, bank legislation, pressure on those industries, yeah. insurance, that's the other, bit. banking and insurance are the two facets right now I've seen or avenues for attacking the industry to the point of like companies being informed you have 30 days to close out a bank account and move it, right? That, so That's not easy when they're a big corporation. Like some of these companies that are getting pinched are huge. Mm -hmm. You can't just up and take millions of dollars or whatever out of your bank account and just magically shift it. It doesn't work that quickly. It, it, it can be crippling. And the same thing with insurance. And I don't just mean like products liability insurance, like you made a thing and you got to have it insured, you know, in case there's an issue. I mean insurance like slip and fall insurance for a building, for instance, something that transcends industries. Companies are getting informed, hey, you're renewing. There's a zero on the end of your bill right now. Oof. Right? So these things, these are unorthodox, sort of unconventional attack uh, vectors that the other side is taking in their comprehensive attack on the industry and on the Second Amendment. Um, I think with that, it, it, it evidences the fact that their, their attack is not only at the policy level, it's really in many ways at the cultural level. So therefore it percolates down into all facets of public policy, uh, not just in, in a particular, you know, conventional Second Amendment or firearm uh, a policy space. Would, would you describe that as asymmetric warfare against us? 
I would. Yeah, that's terrifying. Okay, uh, I just want to say again, thank you guys out there watching live. I think it is really incredible that there are so many people out here that believe in the Second Amendment. I, I really am so excited about this. I want to say a quick thing real quick. I want to say a shout out to my man Adam Kraut right here for returning to the TGC family for the first time in several years. Let's give Adam a round of applause for helping to kick all this off. There is a very good reason that I am so invested in the Second Amendment and I have had a foundation of learning through working with Adam and I just wanted to say a special thank you to him. Uh, I want also, all of you to uh, shout really, really loud if you would like to see the return of the legal brief. <laughs> what, what's that again? Hey, Adam. Hey, Adam. Do they want to see, what is it? The return of the legal brief? Do you have anything to say? Uh, I'm very honored by that. Uh, <laughs> I, I actually do have something to say about that, sure. though. Um, I, you know, for me, when we when we started that, that was the result of a, I think, a Facebook rant. Yeah, Adam at, was just ranting on Facebook, and I said, time. we have to film this. Yeah, and so what John did, uh, he came up with the idea, mostly, and between the two of us, we were able to carve out something where we saw an opportunity to educate people, and I think you've heard a number of people up here on stage already say that education is very important, particularly with that first question. Um, and that was a big honor. Uh, it still is an honor to be able to do for people. Uh, the greatest compliment I've ever gotten was, hey, I learned something. And to see so many other people pick up that mantle and run with it, like Anthony and Jared down there on the end, um, that means a lot. And I think as long as we as gun owners and activists and whatever else we are continue to do that, we're going to turn the tide. I think public opinion has shifted as people get a better understanding. And I think one of the questions that was asked with the cutoff of electronic avenues, just go out there and talk to people face to face. The human interaction um, is very meaningful. And I think you get a lot further with that sometimes than just simply here's a link or watch this video, but have a conversation with people. So. That's what I have to say to that. Ah, that's such a politician answer. <laughs> so it's a lawyer answer. It depends. <laughs> well, it depends. about that, let's take another question. David, how are you, buddy? Yeah, thank you. Hi. I'm What's Dave, your question? Dave Borges with Matador Arms. Make sure you get close uh, to that microphone. Cool, thanks. Um, on the pistol brace law, now that that's been shot down recently, is there a comeback from the ATF? Because, boy, they certainly have a cooling effect on our business. And I'm just curious, what's next? Well, Travis, you want me to take this one first? Yeah, yes, yeah. I would like you to take this one yes. first. Awesome. Um, right now, it's in, it's, they've reached final judgment down in Texas on that at the trial court level. So I mean, I'm, I'm going to give you the, I wish I'd give you like a, a, a crystal ball answer. I don't have a crystal ball. But they've got, the, the rule doesn't exist as a matter of final judgment from a trial court in Texas. The government has the right to appeal if they so choose. It will go, if they appeal, it'll go to the Fifth Circuit. Depending on the outcome there, it could go to the Supreme Court. Now, concurrently, there is a case pending, our case, pending up in the Eighth Circuit right now. It's almost known as interlocutory appeal. It's an immediate appeal of a denied PI. It's fully briefed, awaiting a ruling from the Eighth Circuit. And that's the case that Frack brought in conjunction with SB Tactical, uh, BNT USA, Rick Cicero, and 25 states. Those are the named parties. Uh, so that is awaiting a ruling from the Eighth Circuit. As it currently stands, it is still awaiting a ruling from the Eighth Circuit. It is my opinion that we're going to, you know, the, the fight is not over until it's over, over. And when is something over, over in court? When it's no longer open on direct review. What does that mean in legal terms? It means there's no longer a time for a party to file for an additional appeal. Then a case is over. So is it fair to say that it's over over in Texas when there's an open appeal still pending? I would say not. However, you know, the rule has been vacated by the trial court judge and there is no stay that I know of yet as of stepping up here on this stage for this, for this panel, there is no stay in effect from any higher court. So I, I know you wanted a more you know, crystal ball answer of what, what's gonna happen in a year from now. I don't have that, man. So I just wanted to explain out sort of where we're at you know, across the board. Can and I, I hope one I thing your to question. that? Oh, sure, sure. sure. Uh, just adding one thing to what he said, a very good answer. Uh, in the Fifth Circuit, ATF is appealing. So for cases like GOA, who's with Texas, 
uh, Second Amendment Foundation, all these cases are being grouped together. And so in early August, uh, it's August 5th or 6th. Yeah, August 5th. August 5th, okay, there's gonna be uh, a hearing before the three panel judge in uh, there in the Fifth Circuit. Great question, David, thank you so much. Hey, uh, out there watching live, I don't know if you know this, uh, but there is a discount code that you can use at Brownells. I'm not gonna say the, the web link, but you know how to use it, you're an adult. The code is GUNCON24, it's on the top of your screen. Again, thank you for watching. Hey, Orly, can we take a question from the live viewing audience? Orly. <laughs> yeah, we got a good one here. Uh, this is just for the panel in general. Uh, it comes from Keith. It says, any thoughts on how yet to be invented arms may have trouble meeting the common use test if they get banned before they can become common. Say that one more time. From the top. Uh, any thoughts on how yet to be invented arms oh. may have trouble meeting the common use test if they get banned before they can become common use? So, okay, anybody want to take that? That's a difficult question. It's complicated. I picked that because it had a little difficulty on it, but you guys are smart. Thank you. You guys got a lot and of One of the up attorneys, there. how about you guys? I, I mean, I'll, I'll chime in on that sure. real quick. So one of the cases that, that uh, we're working right now, and I don't have a, a direct answer on, you know, how, how do you make something common before it's common, but I'll say that one of the ways the other side tries to stop it is through abusing the, the firearms and technology assessment process, the, the letter classification process where they will either issue erroneous rulings or they will issue er erroneous classifications or no classification. So we have a lawsuit going uh, right now in conjunction with Franklin Armory against the ATF over the abuse of that process. I point that out because that is one of the other side's avenues. When they, when they find a piece of technology that they don't want to hit the market, they can come in through the regulatory agencies and basically nuke it before it's born by just not issuing a letter classification. And for those the consumers out there uh, that may not be familiar with this, you know, the federal regulatory um, framework is very broad. And so companies, when they bring something to market that's not very, you know, benign or very clear on its face of what it is, they will often go to ATF to get a formal classification of here's what this is under the regulatory system and you may proceed, you know, according to this this category. And that way it gives them some coverage instead of just guessing and being wrong potentially, right? So it's an important process that the industry needs to function in order to be able to bring product to market. Well, I, I would say I'm not a lawyer, but I would say that the common use test does not preclude other avenues of showing that an arm is protected by the Second Amendment. So while it's very important, it doesn't preclude other things. And that's something to keep in mind. That's a great question. Thank you to the live viewing audience. We really appreciate you guys tuning in here on a Saturday. This is absolutely just, just incredible. I mean, you look, I, I look to my sides here, and I see the, the best and brightest in the Second Amendment space, literally like just absolute juggernauts in the entirety of the space. And I, I, this is almost overwhelming. You guys are absolutely incredible for participating in this. Let's take another question. Go ahead, brother. All right. Yes, it's very loud. <laughs> um, we have un we're under threat for with no knock closer, warrants. Closer. With no knock warrants, where for example, Malanowski's case, they killed him. At the end, the law didn't mean anything. They went in. Um, And at the end, they didn't find anybody at fault for not having cameras or whatever they did when they were inside. They shot the guy, and at the end, they didn't find nobody at fault. Then you go for like CRS firearms. He's in jail for literally printing on a card. We also have many other instances where everybody that goes to jail with the ATF has to defend themselves. And they're going against these people with a lot of money in the, for backup. Not only that, they also have nobody at fault. We have to worry about what laws have to pass, what laws to follow, what not to do. And we don't have a backup insurance like they do in um, law enforcement. Are we thinking about anything about doing the same to them 
and having each law enforcement that breaks these laws that should know better than to break the Constitution and get rid of qualified immunity. Are we thinking about that in any way because they have the government to back them up right now? I thought you were going to ask if we were performing no-knock raids on them. But no, that's not going to happen. Uh, anybody want to jump in on that? Are we, are we worried about that? Are we thinking about that? I think uh, some states have already started to fight back. You have states, uh, it started in Missouri with the Second Amendment Preservation Act, which actually has le real penalties for the individual officers who violate a Second Amendment right of a citizen by utilizing the federal government. Uh, and it, it's, it, they don't have the protection that they're afforded everywhere else. It's 50K out of their wallet, they pay for it. And unemployable if they violate people's rights. I think that's a great start. I know there are five other states trying to get it in. Uh, some of them are having issues because Joe Biden had his, uh, his DOJ sue the state of Missouri for actually sticking up for uh, people. So that is still going on and the other states are trying to get it, but it, it comes, a lot of that's from us. Like, you know, the lawmakers, they are, the, you know, we, it's the consent of the governed. So if we don't tell them we support stuff in mass, Silence is accepted. So if, if you have a, a, a relationship with one of your state legislators, a great place to start is having some, time, some type of repercussion for people who violate your rights. That's a great place to start. Uh, and then there's other ways to go from there, and I'll let other people jump in, but the, the SAPA laws are a phenomenal place to start. I wanna make a point that, to your point and Jared's earlier point about getting involved locally, I think a lot of people have, and it, it, obviously this happened in the 2020 election, a lot of people lost a lot of confidence in the voting process. You can't give up on the voting process uh, because if we give up, then we know who the only people are voting and they're cheating. I think that to fight off the fact that in Malinowski's case that a lot of this stuff was covered up, at first, if you remember, Tom Cotton asked some questions. That kind of went away pretty quick, but nevertheless, he only asked those questions because people were calling and asking them you need to ask questions about this. Something's not right about this. They put tape over the doorbell camera and all that. He would not, let's face it, these politicians only care about getting reelected. They really don't care about you. They care about getting reelected. So if you put the pressure on them and continue to vote, that matters. I see people wanting to abandon the voting process and believe me, we all feel the same way that the voting process is tainted, but you cannot completely abandon that. And then when we vote people in, we have to let them know that we're watching them. You have to let them know that. Again, Cotton would not have asked those questions along with anybody else had people not been questioning him in order to do that. So I think that's one thing we have to do. When we put people in office, you have to get to know them. And it's easy to get to know the local people, like whoever the local office is for federal and state people. Get to know those local people. They'll recognize you by name when you call. And I think that's very, very important because, again, they care less about you than they do about getting reelected. And if you keep that pressure on them, it does make a difference. I, like I, I think that comes down to accountability. We have to hold our elected officials accountable. Yes. Sorry. I'd like to follow up on that, if I may. Uh, you're absolutely right. And it only takes a few, either at the federal or the state level, only takes a few constituents contacting a legislator about an issue for them to get the, to get the attention of them and their staff. So it's very important to do that. Um, w we need to send them a, a signal and they they want to make sure they're not doing anything that will get them unelected, as you know. So in Iowa, after an 11 year effort in 2022, we managed to get a right to keep and bear arms amendment to the state constitution. It's rather difficult to get a constitutional amendment uh, through the, the, the process in Iowa. And we, we did that with almost a two-thirds vote of the people in favor of a very strong right to keep Browns and Mammal. We were one of only six states that didn't have any provision uh, for that in our Constitution. And the others were California, New York, New Jersey, Maryland, our neighbor Minnesota. Iowa didn't really fit into that group. So we did that. And I will tell you that legislators and, and other office holders uh, took, really took notice even though some of them were already friendly to our cause, they really took notice that almost two-thirds of the voters voted to add that to the, you know, there was a lot of controversy about it. We, we had to work hard to publicize it, but when it came down to voting day, two-thirds were for it, and, and the legislators took note of that. That's a great question. Thank you. Hey, uh, do you have a question? Yes. How about now? Yeah. Do you still have one? Now's great. All right. 
Um, I apologize if this sounds familiar. I actually basically asked the same question last year. But uh, I've worked in the federal court system for 18 and a half years now. I'm sorry and, to hear that. Yeah, well. <laughs> and um, not a week goes by that I don't see another Bruin challenge come through, which is not an issue in and of itself. But how do you guys feel about the proliferation of as applied Bruin challenges, not for the guys with the ticky tack, you know, administrative, nonviolent felonies, but the guys that are long time violent felons that are filing as applied Bruin challenges to 18 922. Anybody I, jump in on that? I'll, I'll jump in on there that. There we go. Anytime anybody tells me about, because A, number one, I expect to be a felon at some point. I'm probably pretty close right now. Uh, but B, uh, I don't mind if Mr. Felon has a gun because I have a gun. And I can take, if you just level the playing field and I can take care of myself and an armed society is a polite society. So that's kind of the way I go when I hear, you know, oh, we want to make sure that, uh, we want to make sure that the really bad guys don't have guns. Well, I'm going to shoot him in the face. So... <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll, I'll jump in there, too, real quick. So Rahimi was just decided recently, and if you look at what the Supreme Court did say in Rahimi, you know, we, we go back to Heller, really, for the test that's to be applied to Second Amendment challenges, and then Bruin reiterates that it's the text as informed by the nation's history and tradition. So if we look at what they say in Rahimi, one of the things that they pointed out in the majority opinion was this element of dangerousness. Now, I'm not going to talk about it in the context of Rahimi, but more broadly with these as as applied challenges that are percolating their way through the, the court system, I suspect that if the courts can point to, or the uh, government in this instance can point to, this specific underlying basis for their conviction comprised an element of dangerousness, they're going to use that to uphold those prohibitions against those people. It's not going to apply, as you said, to the ticky-tack nonviolent misdemeanors in theory, but for these more uh, perhaps heinous crimes, I suspect you'll continue to see those being upheld through the courts by virtue of dangerousness. A quick I, point, John, I want to make on that is um, I liken it to a child being sent to his room for doing something wrong and they take his video game privileges away from him. Once he serves his time and he gets out of the room and comes back in there, do they tell him, no, you still can't, you, you still can't play the video games? If the court system would do its job and not let everybody plea down and not let the wrong people out, then why are you letting a person out if they're not, if they can't have their constitutional rights back? Why did you let them out if they're still a danger? They should be able to possess a gun if they served their time and did their time. Yep. Absolutely. Great point. Thank you. Great question. Great question. Actually, can I jump in on this? I, I kind of want to answer his question a little bit more directly because it seemed like there was a little concern about utilizing Bruin in these negative fact pattern cases that a lot of these guys maybe had pre-existing criminal convictions and now they're appealing it based on that. I think that's just a natural result of when you have a Supreme Court president. You're gonna have individuals who are already part of their criminal litigation or whatever they're going through are gonna try to utilize that to lessen their conviction. But it's one of those duality things. Yes, you have people like Mr. Rahimi who used Bruin expressly to try to reverse some of his conviction. But then on the other end, you have Mr. Range out in, what is it, the Fourth Circuit, um, who is doing the same thing. And he's a nonviolent individual who is subject to federal restrictions because he lied on an application for food stamps. So it's just one of those inherent things that you're going to have this duality where maybe we have bad actors who are going to try to use this legal precedent to reduce their convictions. But then we also have these individuals on the other end who are getting pretty much screwed by the federal government who are also gonna utilize that precedent to try to help them. So it's just one of those natural things that's gonna happen in our justice system, as you're aware. Thanks, Anthony. Hey, Ryan, do you have a question? Yeah, um, I'm curious what short and long-term effects you guys see and where um, you see in which government institutions the recent ruling on the, the Chevron. And maybe give us a little more, like, towards how it's going to affect the Second Amendment community? Like, in, in what government institutions, and, and related to the Second Amendment, do you see the recent Chevron ruling from the Supreme Court? Yeah. What effects do you think it will have? Well, it's going to affect all of them. Um, and they've been ordered, basically it's been overturned the way they've been using it. They can't do it anymore. Um, but the, the dangerous part, if we're being honest, is they've already started to pivot away from that. They saw the writing on the wall. Um, so think of it this way. Uh, the criminal element no matter what law you pass, they will pivot away to figure out a way to do whatever it is they want to do. 
Well, the government's a bunch of criminals too. They're told shall not be infringed, right? So they figure a way to weasel around it. When the Supreme Court steps in and kicks them back a few, they figure a way to weasel around it. Just like when Bruin came out two years ago here at this event, you know, what do they do? States like New York figured a way to weasel around it. And they're trying to just bleed our side dry because they know that, you know, we fight it in court, it's gonna take four, five, six years that their intended result happened, you know, and then it's, they're gonna just gonna keep fighting as it keeps going along. But the, the attorneys can give you more on that, but it's just, it's par for the course. Yeah, I think it goes back to, we, we kind of addressed Chevron a little bit already. Um, the ATF and a lot of those agencies there in the firearms contact had already pivoted away from using Chevron as the main justification for whatever regulatory action they were doing. Um, as far as like what impact Chevron will specifically have on other agencies, it's gonna impact uh, the EPA heavily, um, the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, all that. It's already percolated as far as that stuff. So I think that's where you're gonna see the biggest impact that Chevron's gonna have on agencies is probably in those realms, which it already had. You already had some decisions in like the West Virginia versus EPA case and a lot of those already were addressing some of those Chevron issues. And the writing was on the wall that with this specific makeup of the Supreme Court, they just were not <laughs> in favor of keeping Chevron as this precedent that was looming out there. So um, I, I think, think the disappointing part is, is that it's not retroactive. So they're yeah, not yeah, going yeah. back to fix everything that was you, they used Chevron to destroy rights and chip away. So that for me, that was the most disappointing part because it's like really from here going forward, be good boys and girls. Uh, so for me, that was the, the part that I didn't like about the ruling. Yeah, it's, it's, it, it, go ahead. that's all right. It, the one good thing I will say about Chevron is it, regardless what it does is it makes all agencies play within the realm of the statutory text. Right. And so regardless of what agency we're talking about, that's, that's what we're looking at going forward. And that's, that's good when you're someone who advocates for an originalist or a textualist perspective when it comes to legal interpretation. Um, it's going to help us in all those contexts going forward. So do you think it will or will not limit the ATF's ability to make up and change law based on who's in office in the, recent, in the near future? It definitely will. Um, but like I said, they already pivoted away from Chevron as one of their main justifications for what they were doing. They were already playing within the statutory language game of saying um, the GCA's definition of a machine gun uh, included items like a bump stock. They were already making those arguments, which is a more textual statutory argument. Um, and they had moved away from Chevron deference, arguing that the, the definition was ambiguous and therefore we can interpret it the way that we want. And so they had already kind of moved away from that. And I, 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 if anything, you can say it really just pigeonholed them as far as briefing going forward. Um, if I may, there's really two intertwined uh, issues that you're talking about here. One is the Chevron deference or the deference that the courts uh, since 84 gave to administrative agencies to interpret their rules and it gave them great latitude and, and, and so it was very difficult to challenge those in a court. And the other is some of these other cases have come up recently uh, challenging the, uh, the adoption or formulation of regulations under the Administrative Procedures Act. So they're not, they're not properly uh, formulated and, and that, so that's a valid challenge. And then the second one is that it, it, with the Chevron, uh, if you challenged it, you couldn't take it to court. A lot of these things couldn't be taken to court. So I'm a retired pilot, so dealing with the FAA, uh, if they say you violated a rule here, a rule there, and we've, we're going to impose punitive fines on you, you, you appeal it, you appeal it to the FAA, within the FAA, and you go up, and maybe you get to take it to the National Transportation Safety Board, and they give deference to the thing. But it's very difficult to get out of the administrative agencies and, and go to the court system. Well, now, uh, you said it, they bleed you dry as you go through the court system. Well, they bleed you a lot drier if you have to stay within the administrative agency because there's never any chance really that you're ever going to prevail. It's almost oh, never prevail under the administrative rules. If we can go to court, uh, it may still be costly. Remember, they say you can't fight City Hall, right? It happens at the same at the local level. Uh, it's, it's, it's difficult to challenge the government. But That's at right. least if you That's can right. get it into the court system and say this, this is an invalid rule and shouldn't be applied in this way, the court will have the final say, and so hopefully, you know, there'll be help for somebody that needs needs help in challenging it. But I, I think that's the real difference. And the other thing about Chevron, I, hang on, we we got to keep it rolling. We okay. got to keep it rolling. Thank you, Ryan. I appreciate yeah. you. Hey, uh, we have very limited time. Let's keep the next few questions very short. We're going to keep our answers short. Go ahead, brother. Okay. <laughs> it's pretty obvious that the financial industry does not like the gun owner of America. 
Bank of America, Wells Fargo, etc. What I propose is that the gun industry band together and make their own bank. Get the working capital of the Second Amendment Foundation, GOA, Brownells, every other gun organization together. They can borrow from that bank. They can open so, so that up. So what, what's your question? Why don't we get together and make our own bank? Okay. So money, want to jump on that real quick? I, I don't have enough money. <laughs> I, That's I, fair. If I, I had there more, is an I'd effort. Do I don't have the details on it, but I think there is an effort to do exactly that. Go ahead, Travis. Would you believe me if I told you that there's bankers already thinking that way and might have talked to one a couple weeks ago? Hey, how about that? It's in the works, apparently. All right, what's your question? Let's keep it kind of short. I understand. Um, with Brandon Herrera getting within 400 votes in Texas 23, we have now demonstrated that a YouTuber is a bigger influencer than, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars out there. Um, got involved in politics, long, very long story for that part, which I'll skip. My question, I guess, to you guys are, what can you guys feel like you can do? You know, I, we got social media influencers, you know, my wife ran for politics, you know, did great, got outspent 15 to one. That's what they replicated for Brandon Herrera to go against that. But Brandon Herrera had a lot of his other what, YouTuber what, what's friends. What's your question? That's what I'm getting to. He had a lot of people that stepped up that said, hey, let me interview these people. Let, let's give them the publicity they needed. And I didn't know what your guys' co commitment or thought was on doing that. A lot of people are like, I don't want to endorse anybody. But, you know, the mainstream media, like, wouldn't interview my wife. But all of you guys probably would because you're, you know, she's pro 2A. I was saying putting in your mindset of what would you guys do potentially in the future to go, let me start interviewing these people to see if they are someone that we should get behind. I think all of us have done that in some yeah. way, shape, or form. We've all, we've all done some version of that. I think so. I yeah. think uh, in the case of Brandon, everybody up here supported him as best we could yeah. in, in every way. Uh, and I think we're, we would continue to do that for any candidate that says they're pro 2A. You know, we w of course we want those people to be lifted up and supported. Great question, though. Go ahead, brother. Uh, thanks. There are scores of assault weapon bans around the nation. Can you get close to that microphone? Sure. There are scores of assault weapon bans around at the moment, both at the state, uh, county, local levels. If a Supreme Court ruling goes in our favour, do all of those individual uh, bans uh, immediately get redacted, or do they have to be individually fought at the local level? It's going to be case specific. It's going to be, I mean, we would have to crystal ball what expressly does the Supreme Court say about that specific issue, what language impacts how this state wrote this specific law. The good thing, uh, I guess the good and bad thing is when these states, specifically like California and others, pass their bans on scary, scary assault weapons or their large capacity magazine bans, uh, they're not creative. They tend to copy and paste each other. Um, and so if language from the Supreme Court applies to one, it's probably going to apply to multiple. Um, some states have gotten a little bit more creative, like Illinois, I believe, have gotten hey, a little bit more. Don't, don't give them any tips. I'm not going to give them any tips. They got a little bit more creative with some of their language that made it a little bit more restrictive than states like California. But it's going to be case specific and it's going to be have to address You're going to have to address it based on the specific state statutory language and go through the cases that way. As a true attorney would say, it, it depends. depends. Uh, well, yeah, yeah it, it, it depends, but also if there is a broad ruling that yeah. does cover all of those, it's just a matter of that decision being you know, sent to those courts and those courts entering judgment. So it might not happen you know, overnight, but it'll be pretty quick after the fact because it is binding on all the lower courts as well. Okay, great question. Matt. Hi. Um, really, this is a question for the... SAF and GOA, what do you guys look for in plaintiffs and situations when challenging stuff like GCA 68 and the prohibition of, say, interstate transfer of firearms or other gun parts? Okay, try to keep that as short as possible. That is a complicated <laughs> question. Try to keep that real short. The biggest bang for the buck to take down as much gun control as possible. Great answer. 
How am I going to follow that one? I don't know if you can. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I think we both, when we vet plaintiffs, we look for somebody that presents themselves well, might have a compelling story to go along with it. You know, while that shouldn't matter because it's a matter of law, sometimes stories do help. Uh, and it's just a matter of looking at it and seeing how does this affect people? What's the public benefit and how broad is it? So I would echo Eric's answer in a lot of ways. Yeah. Do you have a submission process that people feel like it on your website or do you go looking for them? So there's typically two ways that SAF handles things, and I'll let Eric you know, tell how his organization does it, but we have strategic litigation where we're looking at what the field of law looks like today and how we want to shape it for the future, how to restore the Second Amendment. Uh, some of it's reactive, you know, post brew and all these carry bans, uh, that would be reactive. And then we also have opportunistic, where somebody does submit something on our website or calls our office and says, hey, I have this problem. And we look at their problem and say, okay, not only can we help you, but there is a broader public benefit, and that's what we're here to to do. So those are two ways that we evaluate cases as to what we're going to bring. Yeah, ditto to what Adam <laughs> said. <laughs> Thank you for keeping that short, guys. Let's take, uh, do we have, let's take a live question. How about that? Hey there, yeah. Uh, we had one early on for Diana, and I asked for some clarity from the person. There was a woman asking a question for you. Um, she didn't really clarify it, but I'm going to read it the way it was uh, initially written. So this is for Diana. Um, what do women feel about self-defense on an overall basis? Women buying guns is a big deal for the whole 2A community. Yes, I, I do believe that, you know, the numbers show that 40% or more of new gun owners are women, uh, minority women specifically. So uh, women are definitely waking up to being their own first responder and understanding that uh, they need to be able to protect themselves and their kids. And then also, you know, you've heard it for years of, you know, if you get the woman, you get the whole family. If dad goes and shoots, dad goes and shoots. If mom goes and shoots, everybody goes and shoots. So it's really important to get the women uh, involved and, and educate them. And, you know, Women for Gun Rights is a great place, womenforgunrights.org. I'll give a little plug. And not only for the women, but if you go to our landing page, everybody here, I feel like everybody here wants to know what you can do. We have a um, effective communications sheet. So if you're going to go to the Thanksgiving dinner, if you're going to do an interview, go to womenforgunrights.org, and there is a on our landing page. There's a one page. Uh, why do you oppose red flag laws? Why do you oppose universal background checks? And they'll give you three little bullets on every one of those. So educate yourself, influence your friends, your families, and your neighbors, and that's what's going to help us sim the tide. That giving people those tools is really big. I appreciate you guys doing that. I didn't know you had that. That's awesome. That's great. So that's, that's going to be it for the questions. However, I want to give these guys up here an opportunity to say something. Again, there's a lot of us. Let's keep it kind of short. We're going to start over here at this end. Jared, do you want to add anything before we kick this off? Yeah, you guys and gals don't understand how powerful you are. We need you as part of the fight. If we have a ton of more people helping at every level, we're going to win. And everybody give a big hand to John Patton for doing right. this again. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Jared. Anthony, do you want to say anything? Uh, again, thank you, everybody, for coming out. Um, thank you guys for your support. Like Jared said, you guys are the reason we do this. You guys are the ones that have the power. Get out and vote this year. Your vote does matter. Like Jared said, we have 10 million registered gun owners that do not vote. We need your help. And one of the other things that just popped in my mind, because we were talking a lot about how organizations vet plaintiffs and what can the community do to help. A lot of the times these organizations want to file lawsuits, but they need plaintiffs. I'm a plaintiff in a lawsuit, and that was really because they couldn't find anybody else who was willing to step up. I know it's scary sometimes to put your neck on the line, but as a community, we have to help these organizations so they can actually do their job as well, because we need standing in the courts, we need plaintiffs. And so if you're passionate about a specific topic, like Adam said, sometimes they get cases because it's specific to you. So, again, reach out to these organizations. That's one way you can help them. Thanks, Anthony. Again, thank you all for coming. Uh, it's great to see such a good turnout. And uh, Brownells is a wonderful organization. Pete Brownell is a member of the Iowa Firearms Coalition Board, and we certainly have appreciated his uh, support and his family's support over the years. I would, again, uh, urge you to visit iowafc.org or come visit our booth back here. All these organizations are back here in the corner. Uh, come visit us there. They are our volunteers. I see one in the audience there. And talk to them. Learn how you can get involved. And, and at the website, there's a, there's a variety of information there. Uh, blogs, YouTube videos, 
Uh, every, every Wednesday we do a uh, Warrior Wednesday interview, uh, generally with our chairman, John McLaughlin, and uh, air that on Facebook and our YouTube. So uh, check us out and, and help be part of the solution. Thanks, Richard. First off, John, thanks for having me out. Um, Absolutely. For the viewers out there, if you're part of the firearms industry, please, please visit us and consider joining. If you're not part of the industry, please visit our website as well, fracaction.org. Please consider donating. We're always grateful for that. And I'll reiterate my earlier point about the other side is taking a comprehensive approach towards bringing down the industry and attacking our rights. So that requires a comprehensive response from those that are in support of our industry and in support of our, our civil rights under the Second Amendment. Thanks, Travis. Uh, thank you all for coming out. Thank you to uh, GOA members. Uh, just to let you know, we're having our first ever national convention in Knoxville, Tennessee. Thank you. That, that's going to be in mid-August. So if you're a GOA member, you get in free. We want to see you there August 17th and 18th. Uh, there is something for the whole family. It'll be Christmas in August for gun owners. So uh, check out our website, gunowners.org forward slash goals, G-O-A-L-S. So gunowners.org slash goals. Thank you. I'll be there. Go ahead, brother. Okay, guys, real quick, I want to mention this. In 2014, Donald Trump placed a bid to buy the Buffalo Bills for $1 billion. He lost that bid by $400 million. He then decided to run for president. For those of you who think there's no confidence in the voting system, Hillary Clinton obviously would have won that election. Donald Trump won the election and we got three Supreme Court justices. We would not be having conversations about Bruin mm -hmm. or Chevron had it not been for that election. I'm not telling you who to vote for, I'm telling you it does still matter. That's awesome, man, thank you, I agree. It does matter. Uh, well, thank you all for coming out. It's great to see so many of you do care about the issue and want to be involved. Um, I think the point I would make is there are a lot of choices as far as groups to support and do your research. If you like what we do, you like what GOA does, go support us. You know, we all work to win for you. And even if it's a case that isn't a SAF case that ultimately gets a win, it's good for everybody. And we do everything we can to support each other in that regard. Um, the, the only other thing I would say is we have our annual gun rights policy conference in the fall. This year it's going to be in San Diego, September 27th through the 29th. And you'll get to meet a lot of the lawyers who are on the front lines doing this stuff, uh, activists from various uh, state groups, and state groups are very important in all this process. Diane Muller, I believe, will be there. Uh, and, you know, you can come learn some things, learn how to be an effective advocate in your state. Thanks, Adam. Diana, anything? Oh, how do I, I mean, A, look at this lineup. I look down here and I see all their faces looking at me and it's an it's amazing lineup that you put on, John. Thank you very much for having us. Um, be a part of every one of them. I'm talking like, you don't have to give millions of dollars. I think it's like 40 bucks probably a whack. Give everybody, give everybody. Now, Women for Gun Rights, it's free to join, but more importantly, also, it's free to follow everybody on social media. And that, those are numbers that matter, too, until they squash us. Um, so Women for Gun Rights on Instagram and uh, Facebook and all those places. Um, yeah, it's, uh, and you'll notice that I'm in teal, teal for 2A. Uh, the other side does a great job of optics, and this is where our side lacks. They have red shirts of Moms Demand Action. Does anybody know Moms Demand Action? Ooh. Well, those people, those people Wait, are, are using the, the women's voice to call from our gun control, emotional things. And that's where I think Women for Gun Rights really kind of steps in uh, and fills a void there. So, yep, we need people. Thank you, guys. Hey, uh, this was absolutely incredible. The amount of you out there watching live, sitting right here in front of us, asking amazing questions, just showing your support. I just want to say thank you to each and every one of you. And remember, there is a discount code, GunCon24 at Brownells. Thanks, guys. <laughs>